vitamins B1 and niacin. Wonderful breakfast will start them out warm and happy and satisfied. pleasures in life. I love it. I love to eat. I like to fix big dinners for my friends and have a good time and eat. But you don't have to eat things that are bad for you in order to have things that are succulent and tasty and wonderful. If you haven't uh, tasted a lot of things in their natural state, you should run right out and do it because it's great. I mean, it's really fantastic. And it's, it's a shame that so many people miss out on that because of so-called convenience foods. The character of our food supply has changed considerably in the past 25 years. Until 1950, we had essentially an agricultural food supply. That is a situation where food was grown by the farmer, taken to the uh, market, bought unchanged by the housewife, and cooked and prepared for a family. Since 1950, and increasingly since 1960, uh, we have developed, a, or we have had pushed on to us, an industrial food supply, that is one where foods were more and more processed and where instead of the food uh, as grown being sold, the food was in a sense mined and entirely new foods uh, made from it. Processing of food itself is not a new idea. But new methods of processing are changing our eating habits with factory foods in bewildering numbers. Many of the modern foods, so-called modern foods, are not nearly as nutritious as the old-fashioned fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other products we got from the farm. Uh, many of these foods are high in sugar, high in salt. Uh, in a number of cases, nutrients have been removed from the foods. And when you add this up, the nutritional content of the American diet has actually deteriorated in recent years. Things are getting worse, not better. Today, though we can buy good food, our diets are worse than they were 10 years ago. Too many of us have health problems because we eat poorly. Too many non-nutritious foods, too few vitamins and minerals. This bread that I'm making right now is made with whole wheat flour, which is just uh, stone ground, and honey and milk, and some added wheat germ. So, it, you know, it'll be a good bread. I mean, it'll not only taste really delicious, but it'll be a really useful and good food. Whereas white bread that you buy in the store or white bread that you make yourself out of refined, you know, white flour that's had the wheat germ removed and the bran removed is almost entirely starch. As food is processed, nutrients are usually removed. The milling of grain is a glaring example. Most of the minerals and vitamins in a wheat kernel are on the surface and the bran and outer layers and in the growing center called the wheat germ. Flour made from the complete wheat kernel, whole wheat flour, contains these nutritious parts of the wheat. But most flour is ground further to make white flour. In making white flour, the wheat germ and bran are removed and the major portions of many minerals and vitamins are lost. Part of the protein and most of the fiber are also lost. The bran and outer layers are sold for cattle feed, and our well-nourished pets get the wheat germ.
When a bread company makes white bread, they put back a few of the lost nutrients. Their advertising then tells us how good the bread is for us because it is enriched. What they don't say is that enriched bread contains only a few of the original nutrients. Happily, you don't have to buy white bread. Most stores have a variety of nutritious whole grain breads. There's supposed to be more wheat in a whole wheat than in bleached white flour, yeah. But it's hard to have faith in anything anymore. <laughs> but I buy wheat. Wheat bread is really good for you. White bread tastes gummy. If you get a wheat bread like this, well, you get more vitamins, more nutrition, more uh, everything in it than you would if you bought a white bread, which is blah. It's nothing. You're taking everything out. Many states don't even require enrichment for some flour products. The nutritional loss from snacks, pastries, and donuts may be almost total. Rice is another one of the grains from which we manage to remove most of the nutritious elements by taking off the outer layers. Enriched white rice has had several vitamins and iron restored. But brown rice, whole grain rice that has not been milled, has all the original nutrients. The rice which advertisers urge us to eat is even less nutritious than white rice. After making instant rice, Food companies attempt to make up for the loss of nutrients by dusting the grains with the vitamin powder. Such highly processed foods are increasingly replacing more nutritious foods in our diet. But yeah, I like things like this, like, ham like all these hamburger helper things and <gasps> rice aroni and all that. It tastes good and I can just fix it real fast without having to, uh, to worry when I get home from work, what am I going to do? It just cooks up in five minutes, I feed it to everybody and that's it. We usually buy stuff that tastes good and stuff that we, we like the taste of, and I think that it, in the long run it probably works out all right. It's all food, isn't it? Because of uh, possible long-term consequences to our health, I think the more we uh, hang on to fairly unprocessed foods and the less we let our food supply be invaded by overprocessed foods, the better it would be for all of us. Not only good for you, but fantastically delicious. It's going to be great to eat. And that's the thing about whole grains, is that they're always not only much, much better for you than grains that are tampered with, but always, without exception, much more delicious. So, well, you know, what more can you say? Hydrogenated vegetable oil, sugar, sodium caseinate. Sorbitol. What is all this stuff? I don't know. Sodium sterol 2 lactolate. Lactolate. Light. Sodium casinates. Mono and diglycerides. Dipotassium phosphate. Sodium. Along with the shift in the last 20 years to highly refined and processed foods, there has been an enormous increase in the use of food additives. Artificial colors. A typical instant mashed potato package has potatoes, but also these ingredients. A breakfast cake has sugar, flour, water, and shortening, but also... A packaged salad dressing has all these ingredients. There are dyes, buffers, bleaches, emulsifiers, preservatives, flavorers, moisturizers, and so forth. Whipped cream doesn't have milk in it or anything. That whipped cream is supposed to have milk in it. One reason companies like to use these additives is because it helps sales and profits. Using preservatives, emulsifiers, and stabilizers, food manufacturers can concoct completely new products like pudding cups. BHA and BHT are added to potato chips, so packages can sit on the shelf for three months without going stale. Artificial flavors are used in ice cream because they're much cheaper than natural flavors. 
Caramel coloring makes white bread look like whole wheat bread. Egg bread is dyed yellow to make it look rich in eggs. And a frozen breakfast drink imitates real orange juice with the aid of an orange dye. It's all imitation of the real thing, let's face it. And there's nothing, you know, that's as, that's as beautiful, finally, as the real thing. There's controversy over the use of some additives, however, because they are potentially dangerous to our health. It's not necessarily the case that additives are always bad. That certainly isn't true. And many additives serve useful purposes. For instance, the addition of vitamin D to milk is, is very useful. Adding iodine to salt has been very useful in preventing goiter. However, we have to be very careful about additives because if it turns out that any one additive turns out to be very dangerous, that can mean harm for a tremendous number of people. And down through the years, many additives have been found to be dangerous. And most of these have been artificial colorings. So I think if there's any, any worry, we should be worrying about artificial colorings. They've been found to cause allergic reactions, cancer in animals, and damage of several uh, internal organs, like liver and heart, in animals. One controversial food dye that was once widely used is red number two. It was the most common of all food dyes. All of us consumed it. Yet it has now been banned because it was found to be dangerous to our health. Other red dyes have been substituted for it. Hundreds of foods are colored with red dyes. The dyes make them look good. They help sales. which are also controversial. If you look on the label of bologna salami, in small print, you'll find the word sodium nitrite. This is one of the additives to stay away from. Sodium nitrite itself isn't so dangerous. The problem arises when sodium nitrite reacts with other chemicals, either in the foods or in our stomach, to create nitrosamines. And tiny amounts of nitrosamines have been found to cause cancer in animals. Food processors say sodium nitrite is needed for curing meat and to prevent botulism bacteria from growing. However, often it's used simply to give meats a bright pinkish color to increase their sales appeal. Many scientists and others think it should be banned for this purpose. One place where it is definitely unnecessary is in baby food. A few years ago, another additive monosodium glutamate, MSG, was widely used in baby foods. The purpose was to increase sales by making the food more tasty to mothers. When doubts arose about the safety of MSG for babies, the manufacturers fought against removing it. Eventually, they were forced to. But there was no need for it to have been there in the first place. Today, each of us takes in an average of five pounds of additives a year. Some clearly serve no legitimate need and should be eliminated from our food. We need to be very careful in, I think, preventing the indefinite multiplication of additives in our food supply. We have more than 2,000 now. On the other hand, to damn them all indiscriminately uh, uh, is uh, to be ignorant of the fact that in some cases they increase rather than decrease the safety of the food supply. Still another change in our eating habits is the high percentage of sugar in our diet. By eating a lot of sugar, we invite tooth decay and other health problems. Yet many of us have a sweet tooth and food processors are happy to encourage it. Now I don't think people do realize how much sugar they have in their diet because there's so much sugar in, hidden in foods. As something simple as uh, ketchup and tomato sauce, there's uh, sugar in soup. 
and sugar in the sausages. Some of our cured meats have sugar in them. We eat about 114 pounds of sugar a year per person. The largest amount of sugar used is in the in beverages. A 12 ounce bottle of America's favorite soft drink has seven, eight, nine teaspoons of sugar. Americans are on a sugar drink bench. We annually consume more sugar drinks than milk and fruit juices combined. Peaches are a good dessert, but when they are packed in a heavy syrup, you get four teaspoons of sugar per serving. In many cases, we have substituted sugar-based products for more nutritious ones. Artificially colored and flavored breakfast drinks have not only more sugar, but fewer vitamins and none of the minerals that real fruit juices have. Ingredients in a food are listed in order by weight. If sugar is first, it means it's the largest item in the food. Some breakfast cereals are almost 50% sugar. Well, I like Frix and Kill Chocolate and Cheerios and blueberries. Yeah. <laughs> I like blueberries better than the Fruit Loops. They're sweet and they make you have a blue nose. <laughs> I like Fruity Pebbles yeah. and Fruit Loops. Yeah, as you can see, the sugar ones always seem to win out. Yes, Sugar Fox? I got super sugar crisp and you can't have any. Is it yummy? Right. Yummy for your tummy? Right. Frankenberry has strawberry flavored sweetness. Highly advertised, very tasty. The kids love it. Mothers buy it because like it. Kids see it advertised on TV. And it's a circle that's been very difficult for us to break. And as nutritionists and home economists, we talk about uh, trying to improve our food supply and trying to improve our food buying. And yet we have tremendous forces uh, from our advertising media. Uh, to buy these products. Food advertising has considerable means, about one and a half billion dollars on media, about three billion dollars total. Uh, it serves a very different function from advertising in general. Uh, in general, advertising uh, tends to increase consumption of certain goods and then shift preference to certain brands. In the case of food, however, the total amount of food you're going to eat is independent of the amount of advertising you see. All advertising does is shift your food supply or your food intake from one type of food to another. We can think of foods in four different groups with nutrition declining from group to group. And the first group would be vegetables, fruits, eggs, milk, cheese, meat, and whole wheat products. And the second, white bread, potatoes, macaroni products, some of the better breakfast cereals, and soups. And the third, and now nutritional value is going down rapidly, sugar-coated breakfast cereals, some snack foods, cake mixes, and so forth. And in the fourth, candy, soft drinks, and many snack foods. However, if we ate these foods in proportion to the advertising given to them, this is how much we might eat from each group. <laughs> The net
net effect of uh, advertising really is to try to shift the food preferences of Americans from the better foods to the worse foods, and I'm afraid it's very successful at it. Uh, all the data we have on uh, nutrient consumption by the American people show that since 1955 there has been a real deterioration uh, in the food supply as consumed, and I think advertising is very responsible for it. We have a choice. We can eat the factory foods that are pushed on us by advertising, or we can save money and eat better with more unprocessed natural foods. Oh, 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 oh,